Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week we've got custom paintwork, Sagan riding, a tricked up bike, Giro d'Italia tech, plus another product gets inducted to the GCN Wall of Fame. Well, what is hot in tech this week? Well, let's start with gravel bikes, shall we? Because, well, it's been a week, hasn't it, since we last spoke about them. And first up, Peter Sagan, triple world road race champion. He took part in the first edition of the Sagan Fondo in Truckee in California. And he took to the start line on, well, a pretty tricked up bike, I'm sure you'll agree. So apparently the route of that Sagan Fondo was basically ideal for a cyclocross bike or a hardtail mountain bike. And Sagan's bike for that was in fact the specialized S-Works Diverge from the Sagan collection nonetheless. And maybe, just for Sai, he decided to remove his front derailleur. How did he do that though? Well, the bike is standard, really does in fact come with a Shimano Jura Ace Di2 group set. And he took off that front derailleur and decided to run it one bike. But how did he do that? Well, he swapped out the Jura Ace rear mech for a Shimano XT mountain bike Di2 model with one of those clutch mechanisms. So of course, keeping that chain tension nice and good, trying to minimize the chain coming off. How else could he have stopped the chain coming off? Well, by the looks of things, he had a special narrow wide chain ring on there too. So presumably something from the likes of Wolf Tooth or other third party manufacturers. Now, if ever there was a reason for saddlebags to be cool, this is one reason. Peter Sagan uses one, so check out that underneath his saddle. It's quite a neat little solution, isn't it? I can just about see a CO2 canister or two, in fact, tucked away there. Then of course there's the telltale zip stem on the bike too, which is covered up with a bit of electrical tape so as to not upset any sponsors. Uh, now interestingly, Sagan didn't take the start line with number one on his number there on the front of his handlebars. In fact, number one was reserved for Mike Sinyard, who is the founder and chairman of Specialized. So yeah, best to keep those sponsors happy, isn't it? Sticking out there in California for the time being, uh, the squad of Rally Cycling, where well, they're gonna have six of their riders on some very special bikes for the Amgen Tour of California, which is just around the corner. So for the third year running, they've partnered up with United Healthcare Children's Foundation, and these special bikes will be auctioned off during the race, and the money will go to some very well-deserved recipients. So riders from the actual Rally Cycling team interviewed these children, and then their answers were used as inspiration for the painter to be able to come up with what I think look absolutely fantastic diamondback frames. Just check them out. So the final designs are Hip Hop Dance, Classic Cruiser, Gymnastics, World War II, Gladiator, and the Great Outdoors. So keep a close eye out for those at the Tour of California. I think they look absolutely brilliant, like I've already mentioned a couple of times. Uh, now my personal favorite is probably the Great Outdoors. I think there's some great detail on there. I always think to myself, if I was gonna get a custom painted frame, I would go for something really wild and wacky and cool like that. But then I would ultimately bottle it and just go for something really plain and simple. Anyway, let me know which is your favorite down there in the comments below. Now last week, Cy and I, we put the question to you, does it really matter where your bike is from or where is it built? Now, as ever, the comments have been flooding in and yeah, they've caused some quite heated debate in there too. But here's some of our favorites. Let's have a quick read then, shall we? First up from Lissy Rajam. They say it does matter where your bike is made because for people having more money or sponsors, uh, to buy bikes doesn't matter, but where it's made for people like them who work very hard to buy a bike, it does matter where it's made. Yeah, I totally agree with that because obviously, you know, if you don't have a huge disposable income and you can't afford to be buying potentially new bikes all the time, uh, yeah, you want your bike to be able to last for a long time, don't you? So yeah, good, good comment on that one. Uh, Daniel Foy. Uh, it doesn't matter where my bike was made. What matters is the quality control on the bike is of high standards. 100% agree with that. Quality control is vital. Uh, Newt Teller, they basically echo that. Doesn't matter where it's made. What matters is how good the quality control is. And also, interestingly, a good company will stand behind their product. Yeah, and that is very, very true. 
Wayne Softy P. Uh, they've got some advice actually for GCN viewers, and that is uh, to do your research, not on the label, but where the bike is made and also the quality control. So carbon fiber is a manual process that requires the carbon weave and bonding resins to be compressed and cured to give full design strength. Uh, the design can be great, but if the bike is not made with all the fibers and resin compressed as required, it will not have its design strength. And that is totally true. Uh, I'm not saying anybody out there can make a carbon fiber frame, but obviously the process of assembling all of those carbon weaves and assembling the, the carbon layers, that is vitally important for the ride quality basically, as well as the overall quality of that bike being made. So yeah, you've got a very good point there, Wayne. Uh, Toyn Lubrex, no, but who made it does. Hmm, I'm not sure about that one really, because you could have someone who's made it on, I don't know, an off day perhaps, and they've not had a good quality control. So I think quality control is really, really vital rather than the actual person who's making it. Now the cycling guitarist, they've got a little tale here of an experience they've had. Uh, they commissioned bamboo frame with the intention basically of buying local and supporting the little guy. The frame apparently was delivered a year and a half later than the original ETA, by which time they wrote off the cost due to lack of communication and anything resembling customer service. That's a bit of a sad tale, isn't it really? Um, because I guess that that bamboo frame does need to basically grow, doesn't it, for you? Uh, now, I'm not taking sides or anything like that, but sometimes you do have to have a lengthy wait as well for a carbon or even a steel frame to be built. So it's not just the exception there of a bamboo frame. Now, Mr. Grumpy 53 is an avid commenter on GCN Tech. I think he comments on just about every single video we do. Uh, now he says, if it's a no-name bike, you'll never know if it was built and designed by experts. There are some no-name bikes uh, that come out of factories that are top quality, just like there are some no-name bikes that are made in another factory that are junk. You see the same problem with guitars apparently, beware of counterfeits. Yeah, I can totally sympathize with this one. Uh, I read on some forums about people who buy from certain factories and basically they are ultra impressed with their frames and then of course someone else buys from another factory, no name frame and it is absolute junk. So if you are going to do that, make sure you do your homework because otherwise it could leave you out of pocket. Uh, now Nick Blythe, would any of the GCN presenters be worried about using an unbranded carbon frame, carbon wheels, or carbon cockpit that was bought, for instance, through eBay? Uh, now, their thought is there could be some issues with quality control, etc. Now, funny enough, Nick, with this, yeah, I have actually bought in the past. I did, in fact, buy a pair of carbon wheels. Uh, no name, so I didn't know anything about them, essentially. I knew what hubs they were on them. Uh, as for quality, to be honest with you, I paid probably about $250 roughly, something like that, plus a little bit extra for shipping and then some for Im import tax. Quality wise, uh, initially I was fairly impressed, but after a while, basically you get what you pay for. Uh, in my case, I probably got less than what I paid for because yeah, they didn't last very long. And uh, I, I did put them over some rough roads out there, but yeah, you do get what you pay for. So in answer to your question, I have tried it. I don't know about the other guys, but yeah, I have. Uh, John Burnell, they would happily buy something unknown if they knew they were as good as a pair of zips, for instance. However, brands have a reputation and therefore their products can be trusted more and that has a lot of sway when it comes to people parting with their money. Yep, I totally agree with that because when you are buying a branded product from one of these big brands, you know that the quality control of them as well as the design and the research is going to be top notch. So you have that kind of faith in there, or certainly I do. Now, D. Eldon, he has put a big old response in as well. Does it matter where your bike is made? Yes, it can. Uh, those few companies who design and manufacture carbon components, or composite components rather, in-house, have a huge advantage because of the close uh, collaboration between the design engineers and production teams. So they own everything, the molds, the ovens, all the machinery and tools for production. So he knows two examples in the USA, for instance, Zip, they design and manufacture its carbon wheels in-house, and Allied Cycle Works, they design and manufacture its carbon road frames in-house. Um, now, interestingly, I like this point actually that he finishes with, 
What they look forward to is the day when carbon layup can be fully automated into the production line. This should dramatically lower the cost for carbon components and hopefully make them more affordable. They also hope it will increase the frame size and geometry options that can be offered. Now, as Si and I spoke about last week, uh, the actual process of building things, so for instance, a SRAM Red chain set, yeah, it's not an easy process. There are a lot of different bits of carbon that make up some things like, like that. So a frame, for instance, that can take a long time to actually lay the carbon in the correct places. So yeah, if there was an automated way of doing that in the future, that would be absolutely fantastic and I'd look forward to seeing it. Now, Perfect Tomorrow and Einhander 49, they seem to like Italian bikes. So Perfect Tomorrow, Italian bikes are the most popular but also the most expensive. And Einhander 49, if it ain't made in Italy, it ain't a real bike, bro. Now, funnily enough, that used to be the case, for me anyway, probably about 25 years ago or something like that, when basically the Italian bikes, certainly in road cycling, were the ones that you lusted after. Uh, probably because of the heritage and everything like that. But to be honest with you, in my opinion, things have changed, things have moved on. And whilst Italian bikes are still absolutely beautiful and I still love them, great bikes come out of different countries too. Now, Patinka, uh, they actually comment handmade bikes such as the GCM bike. That's the one that Simon's got and was made by the Bicycle Academy down in Froome. Yeah, he doesn't have a front derailleur on it, but we're not gonna go into that right now. Uh, they think basically they're the best because although they cost a little bit more, you feel like one with the bike. They also follow up by saying, if you don't have the money to buy one of those, then buy local. So then you feel like you've done something good for people who live in your area. It's a nice sentiment that um, not everyone though has a great local bike shop and some people live in the middle of nowhere, but I do know where you're coming from. So I like that. Now finally, Gun Gun Works. In my opinion, the ultimate hand-built bikes are the bikes you build yourself. Uh, there is nothing like the feeling of riding a bike that you designed and built yourself. Not only is a home-built bike less expensive, but you can design it to be the perfect size and geometry for where you ride. Now initially, when I saw this comment, I was thinking to myself, hand building a bike for yourself, doing everything on your own, what on earth is this person talking about? So we said, that's true, what did you build? And believe it or not, Gungan Works got back to us. They've built six recumbents in the last four years, each with a unique frame style. Uh, basically, all but one of them with their own design. And check out this. This is one of its own designs. That looks absolutely fantastic. I don't know much, much at all about recumbent bikes, but well, we do get a lot of people asking for recumbents to be featured. So there you are. And that is one that's been designed and hand built by one of our very own viewers. Next week, we'll have another hot topic and debate for you. Now it's the month of May, so what does that mean? That means it's the Giro d'Italia. And whilst I'm not on the ground there in Italy right now, we have seen some new products being used by the pros. Yes, I love new tech. So we've, first up, actually, we had this picture sent in from a GCN tech fan out there in Israel. They bumped into Tom Dumoulin, and he appears to be using a new prototype integrated handlebar and stem. I don't know anything more about it, but I'll let you know when I find out some more. Now, the squad of Group Armar FDJ, well, some of the riders there, they've got their hands on a new bike. And I reckon it's called the Zellius SL2. And uh, basically it's an upgrade, or rather an updated version of the previous Zellius SL. And how do I know that name? Well, uh, basically I looked on the UCI's list of approved frames and forks, and it was in there as one of the recently signed off models. Now, Instantly, you look at it and you think, well, that looks a bit like one of those GT frames from a little while, while ago, really, with those triple triangle design frames. But it's not a triple triangle design. It is, in fact, the stays do go into the top tube rather than the seat tube. So any road buzz apparently is going to be dissipated better through the top tube rather than the seat tube and top tube. And then the head tube on the bike is more aerodynamic in design, so it takes a slightly different shape. And then you've got a very neat aerodynamic uh, headset top cap cover. Now sticking with Group Armour FDJ, how about this for a bit of neat number pinning by Steve Morabito? Well, in fact, it's not even a number pinning, is it? Uh, that is a number which is basically slid inside of what is a clear stretchy plastic pocket, which appears to be bonded onto the jersey. Now, I don't know if this is from no pins or not, 
But in the past, I do believe that FDJ have worked with no pins for those solutions. Uh, but why would they actually want to do that? Well, importantly, is to keep that number flat on your back so it's not acting like a wind sail. Uh, we do see that used by quite a few teams out there. So keep your eyes peeled and you will definitely see it. And it won't be long, I don't think, until we see riders start to adopt it, even during road races and not time trials. Now, when I used to race, I used to put about eight pins on each number to get them as flat as possible and not like a wind cell. Now, by being aerodynamic like that, it is going to save you some watts because you're not going to be trapping or disturbing wind or at least minimising it. Now, speaking of saving watts, well, the folks at Ceramic Speed, they've been busy decking out their riders at Azure Dazar Le Mondial with some very fetching pink pulley wheels for their rear mechs. Now, recently, Lloyd actually visited Ceramic Speed, so there is a link to those videos in the description below. Now, for the geeks out there, what what size pulleys are they using? Well, on the 9100 rear mechs that they're using for the road stages, they're using a 13 tooth upper pulley and a 19 tooth lower. And then in the time trials, they're using the Jura Ace 9000 rear derailleurs with 17 tooth both upper and lower pulleys. So there we are, a little bit of geek trivia for you. Now back at the Dubai tour a few months ago, we saw a new helmet on the heads of Team Astana and that was called the Air Speed. And guess what? A few months later, they've got another new helmet out. This one's called the Air Master. So it's got a few more vents on there and it certainly does look like it's gonna breathe a little bit easier. It's only got three more vents and one of those importantly, I think, is that one on the top, which is just gonna scoop a little bit more extra air in top to help cool you down. Now, another new helmet we've seen is from HJC, who of course are the sponsor of Lotto Sedal. We know nothing more about this helmet other than it's a TT helmet and basically the visor appears to be held on with magnets, judging by this image. And then Met, they've got a new helmet too by the looks of it. So, as seen on the riders from UAE Team Emirates, TT helmet obviously, and well, it's certainly narrower than their previous model, which was called the wide body drone. So maybe this one is just called the drone. Now, another thing I spotted at both the Giro d'Italia and the Tour de Yorkshire is what I think a new marginal gain for Team Sky. So fluorescent yellow musettes or feed bags. So for those of you who don't know, the feed zone of a bike race is probably about 500 meters long or up to a kilometer sometimes. And basically the helpers of a team, they stand there holding out a bag which has some food in there, a gel, maybe a cheeky little can of Coke for the riders to take on board. So this is a very, very hectic place to be, both for the helpers as well as the riders, because normally you've got a peloton who are all looking for their helpers. And generally those little bags are either white or black and not easy to spot your team. So using a fluorescent yellow one, easy to spot, little marginal gain. Now, of course, a Grand Tour wouldn't be a Grand Tour without Adam Hansen. So, yep, there he is, and he's got himself a pair of those custom shoes that he makes himself, believe it or not, as well as soundboard, a pretty cool-looking Ridley with looks to be a 20 there on it too, of course, celebrating his 20th Grand Tour in succession. Now, interestingly, apparently this is going to be Adam's last Grand Tour in a row, uh, which is quite sad news, really, isn't it, because he's done that. All of those, that's a long time to be on the bike. Now, I must just give a shout out actually to Adam's teammate, Sander Armey, who was stung by a wasp or a bee just before the prologue time trial of the Giro d'Italia. And well, check out that. That is some serious swellage of the face. At first, I thought that was some fancy new tech that he was using across his forehead, but I think it's just some of that kinesio tape or something like that. Anyway, I'm glad to report that he's all okay now and that swelling has gone down. Now, Peter Sagan, we mentioned him at the top of the show, and well, he's got himself some new shades. They are the S2 model from 100%. Now, 100%, basically, they burst into the cycling scene a couple of years ago, and they've made a huge impression, largely because they're instantly recognisable by the previous models that Sagan was wearing, because, well, they're pretty oversized, and they are an acquired taste. These new model, though, they do away with that full-frame design, and I think they look much better, Peter. So a big thumbs up from me. Nice one, mate. Finally, for Tech of the Week this week, a big shout out to Simon Warren, who's the author of those 100 Climbs books, which I do believe Tom Lars is a big fan of. Uh, now, he's just launched, actually, the 100 Greatest Tour de France Climbs app to accompany the book that's already out there. And this is a great example of smart tech that I certainly approve of. So as well as it being highly interactive, you can also link it up with your Strava so you can see whereabouts you figure on those segments. And then get this, you can even navigate yourself to the bottom of that climb. Then when you get there, 
there's some facts about that climb, so essentially you could pace yourself better over it rather than bonking halfway up and, well, crawling the rest. More tech next week. So last week we inducted the Vitus 979. Oh, tasty bit of kit that. But this week, I take it back a few more decades and it's time for the chamois. That's right, so up until the 1940s, basically cyclists, they didn't have a pad in their shorts. So they would ride along in woolen shorts or uh, cotton shorts and basically suffer in silence, I guess. I don't know, I wasn't around, but I guess there's probably a few choice words every now and then. And then in the 1940s, uh, sheep leather was actually sewn into some shorts to, pr to provide basically a bit of respite against the irritating chafing that you would be getting. And then in the late 1940s and early 50s, Italian company De Marchi actually experimented with some other types of leather. So one of them was deer leather because it was slightly softer and also able to be shaped a little bit better too. And then basically cyclists, they carried on using that for about 30 odd years. Uh, and I guess still, yes, yeah, suffered in silence um, because there was no real comfort given from that chamois because it wasn't a pad, remember? And then in the mid 80s, we began to see what are now commonplace, the synthetic chamois, so, or pads rather, uh, that are able to be shaped really well. They're much more hygienic. Sometimes they've even had gel in them, believe it or not, to also give a little bit of extra comfort. And basically, a much more hygienic solution. And my personal favorite about this was the fact you don't have to grease them anymore. Yep, that's right. So those original chamois, once you washed your shorts, you'd actually have to use some um, special grease to actually soften that leather again. Otherwise it would crack and render it useless. I do remember that my first ever pair of shorts. Now, do remember to leave your nominations for the GCM Wall of Fame in the comments down below and tune in next week. And who knows, maybe we'll have picked yours. Bike of the week time. And last week we put head to head the Bianchi of Primoz Roglic and the Ridley of Jens Kukulet. And it does in fact seem that the Bianchi fans, you have been out in force, maybe to spite me or maybe you just love that bike. Anyway, 81% of you voted for that Ultra XR4. Well done. Anyway, right, let's move on then to this week's. So we've got two custom bikes here from the Giro d'Italia. First up in the pink corner is the bike of Rowan Dennis. That's his BMC team machine. As you can see, very pink. And we've got a pair of Shimano C40 tubular wheels, a Shimano Dura-Ace Di2 group set. And I think that's a nice looking bike, but don't vote just yet because in the purpley colored corner, we've got the bike of Elia Viviani of Quickstep Floors, specialized Venge bias disc. So of course, Shimano Jura Ace Di2 group set with those disc brakes, and he's got some purple additions on there too. I'm a little bit disappointed that Elia hasn't shown us his purple helmet on there too, but hey, you have to vote. So vote up there in the corner, and next week we'll reveal the results and have two more bikes head to head. So it's time for the bike vault where we get to rate your bike nice or super nice. So let's crack on then, shall we? First up, Cameron from Estonia and his Scott foil. Now, I do like the look of that. Looks to me like he's got a GCN water bottle in the bottle cage. You always get extra points for that, Cameron. You know how to tickle me. Uh, Ultegra group set. And I do like the backdrop there too. It looks like a lake or something. Um, yeah. It's absolutely lovely, that. It reminds me of just one of those amazing summer rides you have with no real purpose or intention. You just go out and you find yourself a nice place to take a picture of your nice bike. Nice one, Cameron. Nice looking bike. But why have I got two things out here? Well, first up, I've got the nice bell and the super nice horn because Sai's not here, Lars is not here, Dan's not here, Emma's not here. They can't tell me what to do today. Yes. So that's a nice bike. Right, next up, Dominic from Brighton in the UK. Now this is a giant propel, but it's painted up in golf racing colors. Um, I don't really know what to think about this because your bike's a bike, it's not a car. Uh, I like your thinking behind it and everything, but I mean, what have we got on here? We've got SRAM Red ETAP. We've got a rotor power meter. So, I don't know what wheels they are actually, I can't quite tell. Continental GP4000, twos, nice tyres. 
integrated bar and stem, it just doesn't do it for me, for me I'm afraid, Dominic. Um, I don't know what it is about it. It's just, I think it's the colours. I'm just, I'm going to get shot down in the comments, but I'm just not a fan of them. I'm really, really sorry. I'm sure that other people will give you a super nice. For me, though, it's a nice. You're going to get the bell. Right. John Ricks of New Zealand. Check out this Cervelo S5. That's a big bike, isn't it? There's a big head tube on it. There's quite a bit of steerer tube out there too, but it all looks in proportion. And I do like that bike. I absolutely love it, in fact, because it looks in proportion, like I've just said. So 3T finishing kit. You've got, uh, looks like SRAM Force, possibly. Yeah, that. It's a nice bike. No, in fact, you know what, it's a super nice bike because that view in the background is absolutely stunning. Nice one, John in New Zealand. <laughs> That's back, you thought you'd heard the last of it. No, never. Right, Kay from Los Angeles in California. Check out this. It's one of those Vitus, but do you know what? This is the carbon tubed one. Uh, now it's decked out, that looks to be, certainly the derailleurs and shifters, it's the Shimano Jorace 7400. Chain set, not sure. It looks like something a bit more modern. Uh, wheels wise, I can just about see a Mavic Open 4CD. It looks like a uh, decal on that rim still. Original flight saddle, yeah, those deep drop bars. I absolutely love those rims because the way that the braking surface used to wear as you braked and basically it would be highlighted where your spokes were. Mr. Grumpy 53 and I, we had a discussion about this in the comments recently. Anyway, this is about Kay's bike from Los Angeles in California. That is super nice. Well done, Kay. Right, final one, Natalie from Bristol. This is her first road bike. Bristol, of course, is just down the road from us here. And well, it's my home city. Yeah, that is absolutely stunning. That's her pinnacle. Uh, looks to be a 105 drivetrain. That's a great first road bike. Absolutely love it. And you've taken probably one of the most iconic views of Bristol, the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Of course, designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, him, legendary inventor. Uh, yeah, all I've got to say about that is super nice because... If anyone's ever tried to ride up that little path, it's ever so steep. So again, super nice bike. Nice one. And yet the horn is here this week. I'm not sure if I'll be allowed it next week. Maybe they'll just ban me from here in general. Anyway, remember to submit your photo of your bike, including details about the bike, as well as where you come to the email address on screen right now. And next week we'll have some more bikes in the bike vault. It's nearly time for the end of the show. I really don't like this moment. Anyway, what is coming up on the channel this week? Well, on Saturday, I got to look at the bike of TJ Vanguard and that BMC team machine. Nice bike, that one. And on Sunday, we've got another pro bike, this time a bike packing special. Monday, we got some bike packing maintenance hacks. And then there is a very different episode of the Ask GCN Tech Clinic on Wednesday because this one is all about bike packing. Now, do remember to like and share this video with your friends and also to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. Special products like this on sale during the month of May. And then for another great video, how about clicking down here for the big bike pack up that Dan got to look at in Abu Dhabi.